Well, hello again, everyone. It is Nurse Mo, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. Today is episode 95, and we are going to be diving down deep into dialysis. But before we hop into that, as usual, we're going to do a quick listener shout out. And this one goes out to Jaren's mom, who says, I wish I would have found this podcast my first semester. Amazing. I listen over and over. Thank you so much, Jaren's mom, for sending me that quick note. I very much appreciate it. And it definitely brightened my day. If you guys haven't subscribed, haven't left a review yet, and you're loving the podcast, I invite you to do that. I try to pick one every week just so that I can say hello back to all the kind and generous people who have left me such warm and wonderful messages. So thanks again, Jaren's mom, and I hope school is going fantastic for you. Okay, so let's just hop right in. As I said a bit ago, we are talking today about dialysis. And when you're brand new, or maybe you're a student or you're a new nurse, or you haven't had a lot of experience with dialysis patients, you probably automatically think about those chronic renal failure patients who go to that dialysis center. They're, you know, usually it's three days a week. It's an outpatient procedure. They sit there for a few hours. Usually it's, you know, three to four hours. They get their dialysis and then they go home. But there is so much more to dialysis than all of that. So today we'll be talking about the main types of dialysis, some indications for urgent dialysis. So you guys, I learned this as an ICU nurse, as a brand new ICU nurse, the indications for emergent dialysis. So you're going to be learning it now, and many of you are students, so you're already way ahead of the game. And we'll also be learning about the nursing care of these patients that can often be very complex. And you can probably hear Oliver meowing in the background because he's had a very big nap this morning, and he's ready for some attention. So we're just going to try to ignore him for a moment. Okay, so let's just do a quick overview of dialysis. So what it is, is the process of dialyzing a patient basically is done to remove waste and excess fluid. And that's done when the kidneys are not able to do their job adequately. So you're going to see two main types of dialysis. That is hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. So let's talk first about hemodialysis, and you'll often see this abbreviated as HD for hemodialysis. And this is what you think of most likely when you're thinking about that patient who's going to the dialysis clinic two, most likely three days a week for their regular uh, dialysis schedule. For hemodialysis, blood is removed from the patient, and then it's pumped through what's called a dialyzer, which is this big machine that contains specialized filter, and that filter utilizes osmosis, filtration, and diffusion, those three processes to essentially clean the blood, uh, removing waste products, which are namely urea and uric acid. It's also going to balance out electrolytes and remove excess fluid. So in the acute care setting, you'll you'll definitely know if you're taking care of a dialysis patient who has chronic renal failure and already has been getting dialyzed. Either they're coming to the hospital because of a complication of their renal failure, or it's going to be pretty obvious um, that they receive dialysis because they're going to have some kind of a hemodialysis access site. Most often, this will be an arteriovenous fistula or an arteriovenous graft. And what these usually look like, sometimes they're a lot more obvious than other times. In some patients, those fistulas and grafts can get really big and very prominent, kind of bulgy, and you'll definitely be able to see them. But um, 
they're still noticeable even when they're, you know, not very large. As long as they're working, you'll be able to feel them and hear them. So we'll get to that in a moment when we're talking about assessment. Some patients with dialysis, maybe they haven't gotten their fistula or their graft placed yet. They could have a large bore catheter in place that is used for dialysis. So if you see some kind of catheter, most likely maybe in the subclavian area, you don't want to be using that for any medication or fluid administration. Usually it's a very large bore and it's going to look a little bit different than what you're used to. So if you see something that you're not sure about, always, always, always ask. So when you guys get report on your chronic hemodialysis patient, one of the things you want to try to do is find out what their regular schedule is. Typically, that patient will be a Monday, Wednesday, Friday patient or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday patient. I guess nobody gets dialysis on Sundays. I don't know. But Monday, Wednesday, Friday or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Some patients go twice a week, but most go three times a week. So the other thing you want to find out is when did they last go to dialysis and find out if they've missed any appointments. One thing that I see a lot is that when patients don't feel well, maybe they're coming down with a flu or pneumonia or something, um, they don't feel well and they just don't feel up to going to dialysis. So you definitely want to see when their last dialysis was because they may have missed a session. They may have missed two sessions. So always find out if they've missed any of their appointments and then definitely alert the attending physician that um, this patient is a dialysis patient so that they can get a renal consult or a nephrologist on board to manage their dialysis while they're in the hospital. It will be the nephrologist who writes the orders for dialysis while the patient is there. And in my facility, in the critical care environment, a dialysis nurse comes to the unit, comes to the ICU, and does the dialysis there at the bedside. Less sick, less critical patients in some facilities may go to a special room or area of the hospital where all the dialysis is done. So it could be um, a couple of different ways. So that's essentially how dialysis works in the hospital. Now, some patients are going to be so sick, and you'll see this in the critical care environment, that they may need dialysis done every day. And if not done every day, at least evaluated by the nephrologist every day to see if they need, um, if they need it done on that particular day. So the nephrologist will look at things like their labs, their fluid balance, and their just their current clinical situation to decide if that patient will need dialysis on any given day. Let's take a quick moment here, guys, and I just want to announce that Crucial Concepts Boot Camp is open again for enrollment for a couple of weeks here until about April 15th. And if you have not heard me talk about Crucial Concepts Boot Camp, I invite you to go to my website at straightynursingstudent.com and across the top of the navigation, you'll see Boot Camp. If you click on that and select Crucial Concepts, you'll get taken to a website with all the information about my course designed specifically for the nursing student who's getting ready to start their program. So I've got it going open for enrollment right now, ideally for those of you that are starting in May and over the summer. So Crucial Concepts Boot Camp is going to introduce to you key concepts that are absolutely critical to your nursing school success. When you're first starting school, you'll find that your professors are blazing through a lot of brand new information. And some of these concepts may get touched on and some of them you might be left to figure out on your own. So this boot camp takes all of that information and gives it to you before school starts when you have the time to actually absorb it and learn it. 
So some of the things that are covered are dosage calculations. Um, learning how to do medication math is very important. You will have to uh, get a 100% or close to it on your dosage calculations exam, and that's typically in the first week or two of school. So you definitely need to learn how to do that. You'll learn about um, medical abbreviations, medical terms, how to communicate concerns using the SBAR format. You'll learn the the basics of clinical judgment and clinical decision making. We'll dive into writing care plans, what a nursing diagnosis is, um, topics to review before school starts, how to get yourself organized, how to study for nursing school, and how to master your schedule, along with a whole lot more. So go to straightanursingstudent.com and click on boot camp at the top, select crucial concepts, and enroll today. See you guys there. So let's talk in some very simple terms about how dialysis works, mostly because I only understand it in the most very simple terms. And really, that's all you need to know for the most part. If you become a dialysis nurse, you're going to know so much more about this, or maybe a, uh, a nurse practitioner working for a nephrology clinic or something like that. Yes, you're going to want to get way more into that. But we're just going to talk about it in very basic terms right now. So in hemodialysis, blood is removed from the patient and it is passed through a machine and that machine like I mentioned before is called the dialyzer. Now within that dialyzer are some special filters and a dialysis solution and that solution typically contains potassium, it'll have calcium and chloride, magnesium, glucose, and sodium bicarbonate. And that'll be in varying amounts depending on what that patient specifically needs. And that's why, you know, the nephrologist will be looking at their labs and their whole clinical picture and deciding what they need. So the electrolytes in that dialysis solution will be at a lower concentration than what you find in the patient's blood. So do you guys remember from your anatomy and physiology what this will do? So this will create a concentration gradient where the electrolytes will flow from that higher level of concentration from the patient's blood down to that lower level in the dialysis solution, thereby removing excess electrolytes from the patient because the kidneys are not getting rid of the potassium and, and all of that like it needs to. So the dialysis solution will help to balance that out. Now, on the other hand, that solution can contain higher levels of sodium bicarbonate and glucose than what you find in the patient's blood. So the glucose and the sodium bicarb will diffuse into the patient's blood, and that will help correct acidosis while also preventing hypoglycemia. So you'll see things in different concentrations. Just know that the dialysis solution has these things in it, um, electrolytes, glucose, sodium bicarbonate, all of that. And it will be in varying amounts in order to create concentration gradients to balance out what is happening in the patient's body. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Perfect. I hope it does. Okay, so now let's talk about the modes of hemodialysis. So you'll see, and as you'll learn, hemodialysis can take many different forms. And which, which mode of hemodialysis is used, it depends on what the patient needs and what they can tolerate. For example, let's say the patient's electrolytes are A-OK, -okay, but they've got so much excess fluid. They're very fluid overloaded. They're having trouble catching their breath. They're at risk for some really severe pulmonary edema. Then they're going to get one certain type of hemodialysis. If their blood pressure can't handle a traditional dialysis treatment, they may need their treatment done more slowly. So that's very key. I want you to think about that for a minute. So we have what's called intermittent hemodialysis. You may also see it abbreviated as IHD, intermittent hemodialysis. So this is your typical three days per week dialysis sessions that your patient will get. Each of those, like I mentioned, takes like three to four hours or so, and that it's great. It's really useful for rapidly correcting imbalances, removing fluid, removing toxins. Now, again, that toxin, the electrolytes, it's all balanced through diffusion, and the volume is removed through a process called ultrafiltration. 
And I always got this really confused as a new nurse because to me, filtration sounded like what I would be doing with the electrolytes and the toxins. So just remember, ultrafiltration is removal of fluid. So the main disadvantage is that this rapid removal of fluid and the rebalancing of electrolytes can cause your patient to have some pretty significant hypotension and potentially increase cerebral edema. So if your patient came in with a head injury, probably not going to be doing this kind of dialysis because the risk for cerebral edema is already high in a patient with a head injury. We don't want to exacerbate that with any electrolyte shifts. So though we will use this intermittent dialysis um, typically three days a week, again, the nephrologist may decide it needs to be done more often. And uh, that'll be, again, based on the patient's status, um, what their needs are, and what they can tolerate. So another type of hemodialysis, a little bit of a slower therapy. So let's say your patient can't handle the intermittent hemodialysis. So we're going to start trying to still dialyze them, but it'll be done a little slower. And this method is called sustained low efficiency dialysis, abbreviated to SLED, S-L-E-D, sustained low efficiency dialysis. So in this mode, again, Let's say you tried to do intermittent dialysis on your patient and their blood pressure tanked. They just couldn't handle it. So each treatment of SLED is going to cause typically less significant drops in blood pressure, and that means it's just going to take longer. So it's like 6 to 12 hours for a session of SLED, and SLED most likely occurs daily. Your patient that can't tolerate intermittent hemodialysis, there's usually a reason, and the reason is usually that they're very sick. So a patient getting SLED, don't be surprised if they're getting it every single day. And then for the sickest patients, we have continuous renal replacement therapy, also known as CRRT. So Let's say you've got a patient with severe, severe sepsis, and maybe they're not a chronic renal failure, but they're acute renal failure because they're so septic and they're so sick. They're very hemodynamically unstable. I've had to, you know, we've had patients that we've tried to start intermittent or even sled on and their blood pressure cannot take it. So what we then do is we transition this patient to CRRT, and this is a very slow rate of dialysis that is done continuously around the clock, 24 hours a day. It's continuous dialysis. So CRT is also just done in the ICU if you didn't like figure that out on your own and administered by a critical care nurse um, at the bedside. Typically, this will not be the dialysis nurse from the dialysis company, though they will come. Can you guys hear Oliver? I'm so sorry. Hi, Oliver. You, you need to shushies, please. Um, the dialysis nurse will come and get things set up, get the equipment going, things like that. I mean, it varies place to place, but that's how it works at the facility where I am. And then the bedside nurse takes over and manages running the dia uh, dialyzer and um, sometimes that nurse can also manage the patient. Sometimes the patient is so, so sick that one nurse will take care of the patient and one nurse will take care of the dialysis. Um, okay, so those are the three different main modes of hemodialysis. And then a few complications that you want to definitely be watching out for. Obviously, if you're thinking hypotension, because we've been talking about it, you get a gold star. Very good. I would say hypotension is going to be the main issue here. And something I want to say about hypotension that I think is important is that it's relative. Okay, you guys. So I had a patient once whose pre-dialysis blood pressure was like 220. So that patient 
it was just so fluid overloaded. They were so hypertensive. So the treatment for his hypertension was to get him dialyzed. So let's say we've got a patient whose starting blood pressure is 220, and we give him dialysis, and his blood pressure comes down to 170. Okay, a normal person might go, oh, 170 is hypertension. But for this patient, 170 was more his baseline. But let's say you put a patient on, um, let's say you put the same patient on dialysis and his blood pressure went to 120. Now, would you walk into the room and think, oh, 120, that's a great blood pressure. We've done an awesome job taking care of this patient. Or would you think, whoa, 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 that's way too big of a drop because he started at 220. Okay, so I hope you think through that and realize, okay, it's relative. Tremendous drops in blood pressure can be very harmful especially when they're quick. So you just want to be very careful and watchful for hypotension and the degree of hypotension in that particular patient. The patient may also get nauseous, have vomiting, and even have some muscle cramps. So electrolyte shifts do all kinds of wacky things to the body. So just be very watchful of your patient as they're going through dialysis. And if they're a chronic patient, you can ask them, what symptoms do you typically have? If you have any at all, what do you usually do? That helps alleviate them, et cetera. And they'll typically know what, what a good routine for them is. If it's the patient's first dialysis, you want to be staying close by and watching them very carefully. Okay, so um, some chronic complications before we move on are things like bone loss due to altered calcium metabolism, patients having cardiovascular disease, having strokes, and even gastric ulcers. So just be aware that those can happen. We're not going to get into the hows and whys, but just kind of have it in your head to be watchful for those things. Okay, so let's move on and talk about peritoneal dialysis, which I think is so, so cool. Okay, so peritoneal dialysis is also going to remove toxins and excess fluid from the body by utilizing the patient's own peritoneal membrane as a semi-permeable dialyzing membrane. I mean, I just love it. It is absolutely genius. Whoever thought of this is just just so darn clever. It's absolutely amazing. So in peritoneal dialysis, the patient will have a catheter placed into their abdomen. So it's going to be, again, very obvious that you're taking care of a patient who is on peritoneal dialysis. This patient will infuse a dialysis solution through this catheter into their peritoneal space. Typically, patients do this at home. And that is one of the really cool things about peritoneal dialysis is that if your patient is able to they can do their dialysis themselves at home. How cool is that? So through the process of diffusion, waste products, excess electrolytes in the blood are going to move across a peritoneal membrane and into that solution. And via osmosis, excess water will move across the membrane and that will help us achieve fluid balance. So many patients will perform peritoneal dial dialysis. It's hard to say the word dialysis over and over again. Did you guys notice? <laughs> so as I said, many patients will do their peritoneal dialysis, also called PD. Sometimes you'll see it. Um, they'll do this at home and they can go on with their daily activities and their life. And these patients... If they're able to do it and manage it, typically have better quality of life than the patients who have to go sit at a dialysis center for hours and hours each and every week. The solution that they place into their peritoneal cavity typically will have to dwell for two to six hours. And there's different kinds um, and different protocols, but we'll just say in general, two to six hours. And some people will even utilize a machine so that they can do their dialysis at night while they sleep. It'll just, it'll put the solution in and then drain it out and put it in, drain it out. So just know that peritoneal dialysis is great for people that can manage their dialysis needs on their own and want to maintain a pretty significantly higher degree of independence. So some complications of peritoneal dialysis. Well, if you're thinking about 
putting anything into the abdominal cavity, you're going to have the potential for abdominal pain and cramping. And this is often because that dialysis solution is on the cold side. And that's probably a really good exam question. So just knowing that keeping that dialysis at body temperature or as close to that as you can is going to help prevent um, abdominal cramping and pain. Patients could have respiratory compromise. So anytime you're putting increased pressure in the abdomen, you're making it more difficult for the diaphragm to fully drop and the lungs to fully expand. So watch your patient for respiratory insufficiency and any difficulty catching their breath, taking a deep breath, etc. Patients can still have hypotension with peritoneal dialysis. You'd think I'd get better at saying it as I go, but I'm just getting worse. Um, peritonitis. Now, you guys, this is the big one. If there's going to be one exam question on peritoneal di dialysis, if I was an instructor, I would pick a question about peritonitis because it's it is the most significant risk for your patient. So peritonitis is, is, you know, infection that can be very, very, very serious for your patient. So you want to make sure that the process of accessing that um, dialysis, what is it, a catheter in their abdomen is a sterile procedure. So like I said, the patient that's doing this at home has to be able to do it. It's not just a matter of hooking themselves up to a, a jug of solution and instilling it. They have to be able to do a sterile procedure. And then infection at that insertion site is another big concern and dislodgement of the catheter from the insertion site is also another thing you would want to be watchful for. Okay, so Dialysis, nursing assessments, nursing interventions. Let's keep it super, super simple here, guys. Um, all patients are going to be very different, but I would say, you know, there are some key things that are going to be universal for the most part for these patients. You're going to be watching for things like fluid overload. Any patient in chronic renal failure is at high risk for fluid overload. So you are going to be super watchful for that. They also are going to be at high risk for hypertension secondary to that fluid overload. And I believe there's some other more chemical related issues with that. Just know hypertension fluid overload, big problems for your patient. And the other big problem is electrolyte imbalance. So if you think about those three things, those are the key handful ones, but I'm also going to add um, acidosis. So patients can get very acidotic, a metabolic acidosis that can render them very somnolent. I had a patient once who was Pro, I think she was had missed some dialysis, had come in, had not yet maybe had dialysis, but we needed to go for a test. We needed to get the test done. I didn't want to delay the test because um, she needed it. I forget what it was. It was something important, uh, something with her lungs or her gallbladder. I don't really remember, but I had to go down to nuclear medicine to get this done, and um she also needed dialysis, and I knew dialysis would take about three or four hours. So we ran down, hustled, got the test done. By the time we were finishing up the test, I could barely get this poor woman to wake up. She had become so metabolically acidotic that she was um, basically obtunded. We did dialysis, and she, I'm not going to say she perked right up because I don't know if being completely perky was her baseline, but she did come back around more to her baseline. So that's another thing that you want to be watching for with your patients. Um, there's also things like infection at any access site, um, any issues with their fistula or graft. Those can get occluded. Those can stop working. You're going to be assessing those for a brewy and a thrill with every assessment you do on this patient. So if you can't remember brewy or thrill, when you hear and when you feel, you feel a thrill, which they kind of rhyme, right? Feel a thrill, and you hear a brewy. So a brewy, when you hear it, 
place your stethoscope on that spot. You can probably feel the little bulge in their arm where that vein, you know, those vessels are kind of, they're just more engorged. They're bigger and they usually poke out, you know, a little bit above the surface of the skin. Find their site. If you can't find it, just ask them where it is. They'll tell you. Um, usually it's on the forearm, but sometimes it's on the upper arm. Find the site, put your stethoscope over it, and you should hear like a um, whoosh, whoosh sound. And that's the brewy. That's the blood flow through that, um, through those vessels. And then when you place your fingers over it, you'll feel um, it's called a thrill. And it feels like a, a vibration, like a purr. If you have a kitty cat like Oliver and you feel their purr, that's what that feels like. So you want to assess for both of those things. So that a complication is that those can just um, become um, non-functioning. And if that's the case, then they have to get a dialysis catheter like I talked about and get their dialysis that way until their uh, graft or fistula can get um, working again or maybe they need a new one. Okay, so monitoring for that fluid overload that we talked about, that patient is going to get weighed every single day. You'll be watching for, assessing for edema. You'll be listening to their lung sounds, checking them for any difficulty breathing, um, any low oxygen saturation levels, things like that. Patients, um, again, very, very hypertensive oftentimes when they are um, fluid overloaded. Um, patients typically will get their dialysis to treat the fluid overload. If it's severe, they could be on a cardine drip and nicardipine drip, um, but typically it is the dialysis that helps their um, very, very severe hypertension. And then um, imbalances with electrolytes are key things. Typically, um, you're not going to be, say your patient with dialysis or with a, a chronic dialysis patient is a little bit hypokalemic. You probably aren't going to be replacing potassium or replacing magnesium, adding these things in for your patient. If it's severe, they may do it knowing that they probably have to remove it later. But for the most part, you don't add these things to your patient because it's going to build up over time and need to be dialyzed out. So potassium is typically the electrolyte that I see that's most commonly elevated in patients in chronic renal failure. So let's see. Um, patients with hyperkalemia who do get dialysis, let's say there's some delay in getting their dialysis. You could um, ask the MD if Kxalate would work for this patient, which is a medication that they take PO. It binds potassium in the GI tract, and they essentially just poop out their excess potassium. It does take a while. I want to say it's like three to six hours. I think it's like six hours. That number is sticking in my head. Don't get bogged down on the exact number of hours that it takes to work. Just know that it is much slower than other methods of treating hyperkalemia. Um if you are interested in more info about hyperkalemia, I do have podcasts on electrolytes, and I did one on potassium, and I talk about the hyperkalemia cocktails and all of those things that we do to try to quickly get potassium levels down and why we care about that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about meds and some dietary adjustments for our patients on dialysis. So... If you haven't yet taken care of a patient who has chronic renal failure or dialysis patient, you will soon learn that they take a lot of medication. So these patients just, they have to just be really on top of their medication regimen. Some meds are take an hour before eating. Some meds are take two hours after eating. So they have to be able to follow those instructions or have a caregiver that can help them as well. So some of the meds that the patient will be on most likely, and of course every patient is different, but they may very likely be on an antihypertensive medication of some kind. 
They may be on medications for anemia. So a lot of patients with chronic renal failure, again, you know, the kidneys have that erythropoietin, which helps stimulate uh, red blood cell production. The kidneys just don't work well, so they need help with that. So they may take erythropoietin and they may take iron supplements because anemia of chronic disease, you'll hear that phrase, is very common in patients with chronic renal failure. They may also be on vitamin D. They may need a diuretic if they have a little bit of kidney function and they can still make urine. And that's another really good point that I should have mentioned earlier. When you're first assessing your patient with the uh, renal failure when they come in, don't assume that they are completely aneuric. Don't assume that they make no urine. Ask them because you want to just make sure that you account for that, that you have an easy way for them to void their bladder. Don't just assume they make no urine. They may uh, make a little bit still, and you can ask them what's normal for you, and they'll most likely know what their normal amount is so that you can let the nephrologist or the attending physician know if that drops off. Okay, uh, so sometimes these patients are on diuretics. They may be on a potassium binder like that k and they are most likely, well, I've never ever seen a, a renal patient without a FOS binder. And sometimes these have calcium in them and sometimes they don't. Uh, calcium carbonate is a very common one and Savellamar is also a very common medication. So as for that renal diet, this is a tough one, you guys. I would say that the renal diet, when I look at the trays, probably looks the least, I don't know, it just, it doesn't seem very palatable. <laughs> Maybe that's just me hearing what the patients have to say about it. It does always include animal crackers, though, and I'm always a little bit jealous because I love those things. Um, I don't know if every hospital includes them, but it's like... I'm sorry, your diet is so restrictive. Here's some cookies. Um, but um, anyway, the renal diet is really tough for patients to adhere to. It is low salt. Okay, that right there would just hurt me. I love salt. That's the sole reason I drink margaritas. Well, almost. Um, love me some salt. So it's low salt, it's low phosphorus, and it's typically low protein. Um, in a lot of cases, or in some cases, it might be low potassium and calcium as well. So you can imagine there might not be a lot of, uh, well, I just, I have a hard time imagining some really good renal diet foods, but I'm sure there are some. Some would, um, there are some resources out there for adjusting to a renal diet and recipes that are adapted to help these patients adhere to their dietary restrictions. The emphasis is on high quality protein. So even though the diet is low protein, usually we want to make sure that the protein is high quality and the patient may also have to limit their fluids. And that can be really, really tough. Some patients are used to it and it doesn't bother them anymore. If it's a new thing for the patient to be on fluid restriction, I find that it is very difficult for them to adhere to that. So just be very aware of that when you're taking care of these patients and have, have some compassion for them. Um, encourage the use of some salt-free, like those Mrs. Dash, I believe that's a salt-free herbal blend. There's a whole bunch out there, but that's what I'm thinking we use in the hospital setting. Um, and that can help enhance the taste of foods. Actually, is Mrs. Dash low sodium or not sodium? One of the ones that's salt-free is high in potassium. It actually might be the Mrs. Dash. Okay, so don't quote me on any of the Mrs. Dash stuff, you guys. But when you're talking about um, food flavorings for your patient, be aware that some of those salt-free ones are high potassium. So you want to make sure that they're using one that is safe for them. Okay, so that would be very key. And the other thing, um, a dietitian would probably definitely be on board with this patient and they'll need some dietary teaching before they go home, especially if it's new or if you kind of got the idea that maybe they're not super in on board with their plan. Okay. All right. So emergent dialysis. So there are a lot of reasons why a patient who normally has fine kidney function or is a chronic renal failure patient might need dialysis right now. So this would be... Um, like you're, like I said, like they're a patient with chronic renal failure or a patient with acute renal failure who's having some kind of crisis. So there is an easy little acronym for remembering the typical 
conditions for emergent dialysis, and it's A-E-I-O-U, okay? Pretty easy, right? So A is for acidosis, E is for electrolytes, I is for intoxicants, O is for overloaded fluid, and U is for uremia. And don't worry, I'm going to talk you through each of these quickly. So acidosis, the A, metabolic acidosis, again, I talked about that patient I had that just got sleepier and sleepier and sleepier while we were doing her test until I couldn't wake her anymore. Metabolic acidosis is a real big problem for patients in renal failure, and that's because the kidneys are no longer able to... Uh, maintain that bicarbonate balance, which is that main buffer in the body. So if your kidney or renal failure patient becomes, uh, has an altered LOC or becomes obtunded, has a decreased LOC, you would be very wise to get an ABG, which is going to tell you what their pH is and their bicarbonate level and their CO2 level. And then you can determine with those numbers if the patient's in a respiratory or a metabolic acidosis and um, let the MD know what's going on. So A is for acidosis. E is for electrolyte. So again, which electrolyte is the most troublesome one usually? That is potassium. Very good. So if your patient's potassium is really high, you always want to have them on a cardiac monitor and you're watching for dysrhythmias, any ectopy, any tall peaked T waves and bradycardias, really any cardiac abnormality. And Depending on whether or not they're having cardiac abnormalities and when they're next, um, you know, what they're, how they've responded to, maybe you've given them KXLA and it's not working, then they may need some emergent dialysis. Now, I is for intoxicants, and that refers to patients that have overdosed on something. And I'm not talking about like, it doesn't always have to be on drugs, it's just like, any overdose of any kind. Maybe they got way too much of um, one of those uh, anticoagulants that doesn't have a reversal agent or maybe too many beta blockers. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of like intoxicants doesn't mean they're intoxicated. It just means they've had too many toxins, too many um, drugs or whatever in their system. So um, dialysis could be a way to get those things out of the patient's system. Um, again, those anticoagulants that don't have a reversal agent, these patients are very tricky to treat. I don't know if I've ever seen dialysis used on a patient who's had that happen. Um, one of the hard things about that would be placing that large bore dialysis catheter. <laughs> They're going to bleed a lot. So um, usually with those patients, we supply um, packed red blood cells and just try to wait it out. But there are a lot of other drugs that a patient could take way too much of, and dialysis would be a way to get that out of their system. And then we have O was for overload, and that refers to fluid overload. So again, if the patient's having respiratory compromise, then we need to deal with that right away. So dialysis can help them tremendously with that. And then U was for uremia. And when you have that toxic buildup of uremia, those are those waste products in the blood, this causes the patient to have a whole bunch of problems. And that can be that high blood pressure, they could be very confused, very fatigued, very nauseous, a whole lot of things going on with that. So if the patient has significant uremia, that could be a indication for emergent dialysis. Okay, you guys, we're doing pod quizzes at most of the ends of the podcast, because I know you love them. So if you're not into pod quiz, we're basically done for the day. You're excused <laughs> from class. But if you want to stick around for a little bit, let's do a few pod quiz questions. So pod quiz, for those of you that don't know, I ask a question, I pause for a minute, give you a moment to answer, and then I tell you the answer. It's basically audio flashcards, okay? All righty. So let me just go through this real quick and pick out a few questions. In your dialysis solution, let's say your patient's got hypermagnesemia, hypercalcemia, and hyperkalemia, your dialysis solution, will it have higher or lower concentration levels of electrolytes in order to correct this problem? 
Lower. Very good. So the dialysis solution will be at a lower concentration of electrolytes to create that concentration gradient so that it pulls the higher levels from the patient into the dialysis solution, which is then discarded. Okay, very good. Um, what kind of dialysis is done continuously? I hope you said continuous renal replacement therapy, CRRT, very, very good. And that is for your very sick, very unstable patients. And then let's see, what is the biggest risk for your patient who has a peritoneal dialysis? Your biggest risk is going to be most likely peritonitis. You're going to keep a very close eye on that. Another big issue would be respiratory compromise um, and infection at the site. But I would say peritoneal um, dialysis has the big risk of peritonitis, which can be life-threatening. What are some ways that you will assess your patient for fluid overload? Okay. All right. I hope you said daily weights, monitoring lung sounds, assessing for edema, checking O2 saturation levels. All of those can be great ways to determine A, if your patient's fluid overloaded, and then checking their oxygen saturation level kind of tells you if it's affecting their respiratory function. And then what is the PO medication that a patient could take to lower their potassium levels? So that medication is k -exalate, and I apologize if that's the brand name. I know a lot of you guys have to learn the generic name, and I can't think of what that is off the top of my head. Everyone I've ever met ever as a nurse calls it k -exalate. and that works how? k will bind up potassium in the GI tract, and then the patient can just poop it out. It's just magic. Okay, and then let's go through the emergent dialysis acronym. What is the A for? Acidosis, very good. And the E? That's electrolytes, excellent. I? I's for intoxicants, very good. O? That's the overload, fluid overload. And then U? is uremia. Awesome job. And then um, somebody, I think, was it somebody or was it just me? Somebody asked to review the 24-hour clock. So let's do a few just questions on um, the 24-hour clock. So I will say a time in the 24-hour clock and you tell me what that is in the standard clock, just to get used to going kind of back and forth. So what is 2100? That is 9 p.m. What is 1800? That is 6 p.m. Very good. What is 2330? Excellent. 1130 p.m. What is 2015? That is 8.15 p.m. Very good. What is 17.45? That is 5.45 p.m. What is 16.15? That is 4.15 p.m. Very good. What is 22.30? That is 10 30 p.m. Okay, now let's flip it the other way, you guys. And notice I'm only doing the p.m.s because the a.m.s are easy. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the standard time and then you say what it is in the 24-hour time, okay? So what is 8.30 p.m.? That is 20.30. Excellent. What about 6.20 p.m.? That is 1820. Very good. How about 1134 p.m.? That is 2334. Excellent. How about 505 p.m.? 
That is 1705. Very good. You guys are doing great. How about 1027 p.m.? That is 2227. And then how about, what time have we not done yet? How about 448 p.m.? That is 16. 48. Okay, you guys did absolutely amazing. I'm so proud of you. I hope that was very helpful. I do want to make a quick announcement that the July to June nursing student planners are available and they are available on the uh, website and on our Etsy shop at Straight A Nursing Student. Dot com. That's the website. And then the Etsy address is etsy.com slash shop slash straight A nursing. Very hard to say slash. I shouldn't try to say that in a whole episode where I had to say dialysis, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, you can get it in either of those two places. And to everyone who's asking if they're pre-printed, they are not. We had to put a pause on that partially because I'm in graduate school and it was so much to manage. And then partially because I um, needed to find a more economical printer and shipping options for you guys so that I could continue to provide the planners at a good price. The printer that I was using, the prices just kept going up, 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 up. And I just did not have the bandwidth to go through the whole process of, of locating another printer. Possibly after I'm through with graduate school, we'll revisit that. But I had to really choose. Do I want to spend time doing planners or creating content for you guys. I had to pick and I wanted to create content for you guys. So the planners are PDF and in digital format. So the PDF ones, you guys, I have been uh, working with, you know, recommending basically this company called Nine Set Color Copies for a couple of years now. And they're doing a really good work. And we even have a simplified ordering process through them. So what you do is you get the digital file, the PDF file from my website or my Etsy shop, and then just upload it to their site and they print it for you, bind it, laminate the cover and send you a finished product. The only difference is it doesn't have the monthly tabs. I think that's something they're working on. We'll see. I'm not sure I want to see it before I tell you guys about it, but they don't have it yet. Um, if you are, if that's like, a deal breaker for you, send me an email. I've got a good resource for cute tabs that you can attach yourself. Anyway, the whole point of this speech is that they're available and I hope you love them. People have really liked them and I find that the PDF file using the company that prints it, binds it, laminates it is kind of a nice... Um, easy way for you guys to still get it printed. But um, when I am just don't have the capacity to do that right now, graduate school is ending soon. And I'm really happy about that. And then there's the digital version, which is for use with the iPad, it works best with good notes, but it can be used with notability. The big difference is good notes has like that simulated page turning Whereas I believe with Notability, it's more of a scrolling, but that's just personal preference. And if you love Notability and you don't want to buy another app, then you don't need to. If you love GoodNotes, then fine. That's great too. So anyway, straightanursingstudent.com or on Etsy, which is etsy.com slash shop slash straightanursing. I'll link to that um, in the show notes so that you guys have easy, easy access to it. So anyway, I hope you are all doing amazingly well and you're about to the end of your semesters. And if you have any questions, ideas for other podcast episodes, I invite you to please reach out. I absolutely love hearing from you and I take your ideas and I put them in a little folder for future podcast episodes. And so we will get to them eventually. Again, thank you so, so much and have a great day, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.